I was working as a secretary at the English Department of Columbia College in Chicago. Lori Barbera calls and says, Michelle, quit. We're supposed to record a record, and then we're going on tour with Lush. Do you want to join? Behind every favorite artist, song, or lyric is a story you've never heard. In Voices Behind the Music, we go much deeper than the frontman you hear on the album or the guitarist you see on stage. People from all aspects of the music industry work together to make the business what it is and are often some of the busiest but nicest, funniest, and smartest people out there. I'm Jeff Yasuda, CEO at Feed Media Group, the creators behind the leading B2B music licensing platform. Join me as I sit down with some of my favorite voices behind the music to hear their insider stories about what makes the music industry so exciting. Today we have the fabulous Maureen Herman on the show. Maureen is an accomplished writer and editor having worked at Musician Magazine and as a freelance journalist for Rolling Stone. Mo, as we call her, and I also had a chance to work together on my very first startup called Fuzz Artists way back in 2005. I can't even remember how long ago that was. Mo is probably best known, however, for being the bass player for Minneapolis-based all-female punk band Babes in Toyland, which was signed to Warner and hit Lollapalooza by storm in 1993, along with former high school classmates Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine and Adam Jones of Tool. Mo's also been deeply involved in the nonprofit world, having co-founded Project Noise, along with our mutual pal Chris Karakis, to focus on social justice. Most importantly, though, Mo is just a downright awesome gal, a longtime friend, and just loads of fun. Mo, welcome to the show. Wow, thank you for that intro, Jeff. That was very good. <laughs> you hit all the points. <laughs> and it's all true. And it's all true. So, uh, well, for starters, tell me what you're working on. What are you doing now? So right now I'm working on a book, my memoir. And when are you planning to release that? I'm putting the pressure on you, Mo. You got to get this out. That's okay. I'm, I'm delivering it before the goal is, before the holidays, and I really need to keep that deadline. So it's supposed to be out, if, if everything goes as planned, it should be out spring or summer of 2022. Oh my gosh. Now, can you share the title or is that double secret probation? I can t share the title, but I will have to, I won't swear, but I'll, I'll, it's called, it's a memoir, mother. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. okay. Got it. And Got it. That was a joke working title that I had because I couldn't think of a title. And then I put that in the version that I gave to my agent and he said, that's the title. And I'm like, no way. They're not going <laughs> to go for it. And I don't even want that to be, but then the, the publisher wanted it. So it's in the, it's in my contract. Who that knows? is that is awesome. And, and it's so you. It's so you. <laughs> so great. So you're working on that. And then, you know, when you're not writing, what else are you up to? Um, I have an 18 year old daughter and though she's in college, she lives at home. So there's still parental duties going on. And actually I've become kind of domestic and I've been, I, I'm into gardening and stuff and <laughs> home decor. No, I just finished kind of like getting my house situated. I, I moved to a small town in Illinois from Los Angeles in 2019. And um, it's actually Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machines grandparents house. He inherited it and it's been sitting empty. It was sitting empty for a long time. And so it just kind of worked out. And I, I moved to Illinois where I have some family. So well, and let's let's go back. Let's go back to your high school days of Libertyville High School. Um, my God, how was it? You know, going to school with folks like Tom and and Adam of Adam Jones of Tool, and it must have been a wild experience. Yeah, I mean, it was. You know, it it was wild when we were adults because you know when we were younger we didn't know where we would all end up. You know, but it was still a very there was this group of people. And we're still a really hardcore group of people. It's the same people that were on the school paper together. And so they were also in theater. I was not into that because there's no way I was going to get on stage. 
at that time. Okay, the irony is palpable. I know, stage fright. But I knew them all from the school paper. And so, and Libertyville is like this white suburb from, you know, of Chicago, you know, fairly affluent, not like affluent, affluent, but, you know, upper middle class, middle class kind of thing. So, you know, that was kind of the vibe of the school. Tom was one of three black people at the school and he was the first one. So, wow. And his mother was the history teacher there, Mary Morello. And this is actually where she grew up is my house. But anyway, everybody was just so smart and creative. And I just kind of didn't really appreciate how unique they all were. You know, Tom and Adam, you know, they were in a band called the Electric Sheep at that time. But also like our my friend Jim, who's now the editor at FAIR and almost, I'd say with without exception, everybody is in the music or film or TV business that is in the group. In fact, they are. Every single person is. And it's 20 people. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So let's, and I obviously want to hear all about Lollapalooza 93, but tell us about how Babes in Toyland came together. How did you start playing bass? I want to hear all of it. So growing up, I loved music, but, you know, I had, I took piano lessons, but it was more kind of like I also took other kinds of lessons. It wasn't like this special thing to me, you know, but I liked it, but I wasn't very good at it. You know, I learned the names of the notes and I learned where they were on the keys and all that stuff. So it was OK. It was good. We had a piano in the house. But my brother at that time, he was in high school and he had a garage band and I don't remember the name, but they literally played in our garage. He, had, he was a bassist. He had a bass guitar. And so he taught me smoke on the water one day, just out of whatever, I guess he was bored or high. I'm not sure. He used to deal pot out of the window well of the basement where his bedroom was. So whatever. But no, he was very colorful. He's sober now. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, so he, uh, in later years, you know, he moved to Minneapolis and so did I at some, at one point after our parents did. And, um, he got his hand stuck in a pasta machine at work and the guy, and he was in the basement and the guy who, who they hadn't opened yet. It was early in the morning. And the guy, the only other guy who was there was upstairs vacuuming. So he couldn't hear him screaming. Oh my God. So when they finally got to him, when the fire department came, they had to manually take the machine oh. apart because they couldn't roll it backwards. So his hand was flattened for, quite a while. Oh my God. Can he still use it? Well, he can. Yes. No, he can still use it, but he couldn't for a while. And it was, it, it was never quite the same. And so I had started dabbling in music by that time. I was in my early twenties and um, he just like came over one day. He knew I was like having people come over and play in the basement and stuff. I lived in a warehouse. He just like get, had this look on his face and he just gave me his bass. He's like, here, have it. And I'm like, okay. You know, because I was trying to teach myself guitar and stuff. So then I had a bass. So then that's what I played, you know. Wow. Wow. <gasps> so you started playing in, in other bands. and It's interesting because right after I got the bass, I didn't know how to tune the bass or the guitar that I had. And I knew Kat Bieland of Babes in Toyland. She lived over the walking bridge from me. I asked her if she could come over and teach me how to tune my bass. And so she taught me, <laughs> and, you know, I had no idea that years later I would be in that band because I was at their very first show in a basement at a party. That's amazing. Tell me a little bit how Babes in Toyland blew up. In 1991, Sonic Youth had booked a tour to Europe. So they were doing Reading Festival and a lot of big clubs. They were really hot then they were in their peak and they tapped nirvana and babes in toyland to be their opening acts so they went overseas and they became huge but back in the states the babes were still kind of like this van touring band who weren't very well known and whatnot but now they had this uk situation so they started going over there a lot and then that started to bleed into you know, getting asked to be on tours. They were already signed to Reprise. The Babes got signed to a major label long before Nirvana or any of those other bands. And it was just one of those things. It wasn't for a lot of money, but they did get signed and they did have, it was uh, Warner Brothers Records, Reprise Records. So anyway, they, they did really great in the UK. And um, when they were supposed to record the first record, Michelle 
the bass player, her boyfriend got shot and killed. He was Henry Rollins' tour manager. She was just distraught. And I, I see, I never got good things didn't happen to me without somebody like either smashing their hand or dying, you know. So anyway. <laughs> Gosh, Mo. So she she quit the band and they were they had they were already booked for a tour and they were supposed to record the record like in weeks. And they, they happened to be playing in Chicago and they always stayed at my house when they played in Chicago because I lived in a warehouse and on the first floor you could literally open the doors and you could drive your van in with all the equipment in it. And so Kat and Lori were staying with me, but Michelle wasn't. And I don't know. And then I showed them like, oh yeah, I've been playing in some band, you know, I've played in a band with some friends, you know, da, 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 whatever. It was no big deal. I wasn't like, you know, I didn't know that anything was going on, you know, with them. But um, then I got a call. I was working as a secretary at the English department of Columbia College in Chicago. Lori Barbero calls and says, Michelle quit. We're supposed to record a record and then we're going on tour with Lush. Do you want to join? <laughs> That's insanity. Yeah. And actually, do you want to, do you want to uh, audition? It, it was kind of like, you want to just try it, you know, and see. So I'm like, okay. And so I go up to Minneapolis to audition and I'm really excited. And I meet my friend at the coffee shop. As I'm leaving the coffee shop to go to the audition, I get pulled over. Then I get arrested for outstanding parking tickets from when I lived there. Oh my. Oh God. Now no. this is, this is before cell phones. So. Kat and Lori, they didn't know where I was. I was just in jail. And oh, God. Mo. So I could make one phone call. So I called. I knew my friend, John, who I was meeting for coffee. I knew his number by heart. And so I called him. And he during the coffee, he had just told me, like, oh, yeah, I saved up a bunch of money to go to Brazil. And it's great. And da, da, da. So I knew he had a lot of money, too. And I'm like, John? <laughs> I hate to ask you this, but I'm in a spot. I need I need about two thousand dollars and to be bailed out of jail. And he's like, "What?" Oh my! God. But he had enough, and he did it. And I got out, and I finally was able to tell Kat and Lori what happened. Of course, they died laughing. They thought it was so hilarious. Oh my gosh! And so you just no show to the audition. I just no showed, but you know, significantly before I left for. The, the audition i was roommates with the jesus lizard literally the whole band so i was dating the bass player david sims and Dwayne dennison is the guitar player of the jesus lizard and he sat down and he taught me all the bass parts to the babe songs i mean wow and he's like he's a literal music teacher he's got a degree in music from, oh and he's and, so incredibly technical yeah he's super played. technical and he just made sure that i was going in knowing i could nail the parts and we just practiced and practiced and he taught me and taught me. And I, you know, so when I walked into that audition, I could just play the songs and they were like blown away. And so it was just like, they were just like, okay, well, we're, you, yeah, you're in the band. <laughs> so, and we were friends already. So oh, yeah, we so. were friends. Yeah. And Kat and I had, I, I, I first met, oh, this is a good story. I, I first met Kat, our boyfriend from roommates. And um, we were on the porch and she played me this tape of her quote unquote new band. And it was like, horrible and, then, and she's like yeah i'm gonna start a band and i'm like uh-huh good luck with that <laughs> you know? so like i so she was even back then that was like in 1989 or 86 or so, i don't know when it was but anyway so she uh she was you know determined to be in a band for a long time so but yeah so you know i was joining them but i bet it was also like you know at the time i had a job at I was getting full-time benefits and I was able to go to college for free at the place I was working at. I really liked my job and all I'd ever wanted to do was be a writer. And I was able to, you know, I finally was able to be in a situation where I could make that happen. And then I was like, okay, now you have this other thing. And I really, people don't believe me, but I really had to think about it because it was just something I kind of did, but it was fun. I really wanted to be a writer. And so, but then I talked to like Steve Albini and some other people and they're like, touring, you're never going to get another chance like this to see the world and this kind of experience and just do it. And then you can always go back to school after. So I joined. 
And, and can you remind everyone who's to who the great Steve Albini is? So Steve Albini is, he was a producer. He hates that term. He was the engineer for Nirvana's In Utero, their last album. He has done many great bands from the unknown to the super known, you know, and everywhere from the smallest indie band you could ever hear and, you know, Paige Plant's project. He was a good friend. He he actually was the first friend I made in Chicago when I moved there because we parked my U-Haul outside of his house. And then shortly afterwards, my boyfriend went on tour. So Steve and his girlfriend kind of took me in and introduced me to the whole Chicago music scene. So in the same way that I was thrust into the Minneapolis music scene, I also was in the Chicago, which was at that time in the 90s, the late 80s, early 90s, just burgeoning with bands. You know, 11th Dream Day, The Jesus Lizard, Killdozer, Urge Overkill. I can't even think of all the bands. But Well, and of course there was, you know, Touch and Go Records. Too, yeah, right? I should have which said, was... Touch and Go Records, which was the indie label that was like one of, you know, it's like SST or Sub Pop. It was one of the founding, you know, indie labels. And Corey, the owner of the, of the label, Corey Russ, when I moved there, I had the U-Haul parked out outside of Steve Albini's house until I could figure stuff out. And then all my stuff we, we stored at Touch and Go in one of the warehouse rooms. So it was like, you know, and they were all helping me move. And so it was just like literally being thrown into this scene. Corey Russ, too, I think it's important to note, you know, Touch and Go Records was so different than any other label, right? Corey did most of his deals with a handshake. There was 50-50 ownership, if I'm not mistaken, of the Masters, which was radically different yep. from most labels. And, you know, the artists and Corey's team, they had fantastic long-term relationships, which, as many artists will say, tended to erode with some of the larger labels out there. So Corey was probably very instrumental in the Chicago scene, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Without Corey, there isn't, you know, I, I always referred to the triumvirate of Steve Albini, Corey Rusk, and, and Botch Billions, who was the booking agent. They all started there in Chicago. It started really small and started in the way that you described, real, being very, very artist friendly. And, you know, thanks for pointing that out because it was a really important ethic in that scene. So that was that was a really, again, in the same way that Minneapolis had its kind of heyday, so did Chicago. So, so then the band started picking up and then, of course, you know, come... 1992 when Lollapalooza first kicked off and then 93 tell us about how you got asked to perform on that show on that tour you know it's a little bit of a mystery but I think Ted Gardner who was Perry Farrell's manager um Perry Farrell started Lollapalooza Ted Gardner also managed Tool and my friend Adam Jones was in Tool I don't know if he had any sway or what the deal was or whatever. I know Ted was helping produce Lollapalooza, but that year it was me, my band, Babes in Toyland, going on after Rage Against the Machine. And then Tool was playing on the side stage. So we actually had the highest level in that show. Rage was first. And then, and then, and oh, and then there was a band between us. And then we went on. So I don't know. I think there was, I, I don't know. I mean, it was the time, you know, also they always needed a girl band, so to speak, you know, and so there we were and it, we had just put a record out. It was like perfect timing, you know, da, da, da. so it was a lot of things. But, you know, I just remember getting the call and we're like, yeah, OK, great. Yay. That sounds fun. <laughs> I mean, it really did. It was just like, oh, good. And I, my friends on tour and was just like everything was happening so fast in those days that it was just like another hill on the roller coaster. Well, and let's dive deeper a little bit in the, you know, all-female band. You guys were an all-female punk band in a totally male-dominated, you know, industry. Tell us a little bit about how that was. Was it empowering? Was it, you know, how did, what was your view on that? It was difficult only when it came to the press because babes had established themselves as a band. They were not a gimmick band. They were not like, oh, look at the girls can play guitar. The fact that I just said girl band earlier is hilarious because I was so against that term. But, you know, most people understand what that means. You know, they had established themselves as a rock solid band. And so that was the way that I always saw it was like we're another band and not we're a female. Because it kind of ghettoizes 
you know, like, oh, well, you're not as good as like regular bands. So you have to be in the subgenre of girl bands. And so that's when it started to really irritate me because we started getting lumped together with, with L7 and Hole, which is sure. a little story there. Courtney Love, I know you've got Courtney stories. I've got Courtney stories. But, um, you know, Babes had been around for longer than any of them. The press would just lump us all in. And L7 does not sound like Babes in Toyland. They're like pop metal. Babes is not that. Hole is, I don't know what you would call that stuff, but it's different. And so, you know, I, I felt like our band was more like in the indie rock vein of the Chicago and Minneapolis music scene where we came out of. They just wouldn't look at us as our own. It was all, you know, they were, they would pit us against each other. And, but there was a real situation between my guitar player and singer Kat and Courtney Love, the lead singer of Hole. I have to say that, that when I first saw, I was in a record store and I picked up a seven inch and I was looking at it and I'm like, oh, Babes has a new single. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's Courtney. Why is she wearing clothes like Kat and have a, her hair bleached with a barrette in it like Kat wears? Why does she look like, why does she have a red Rickenbacker? Oh my God. And it was just like, oh my God, she like stole her look. It was the weirdest thing to do. Like there's a lot of like indie rock looks, man. You don't have to just pick that one. It's so weird. And so that really screwed with Kat's head, man. So there was animosity? There was a lot of hurt on Kat's part because she kind of stole her thunder without needing to. I mean, it was a weird thing. Why why play the exact same guitar? Why bleach your hair and get the same haircut? Why dress the exact same? Why put your barrettes in the same place? It's very strange. Same shoes. I mean, wow. 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 And then the tour itself. So it was Rage Against the Machine. It was Tool. It was Primus was the, the headliner. Um, okay. We had Dinosaur Jr., Front 242, who strangely went between Rage and Babes. They were like a electronic oh, wow. noise. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, Arrested Development, Alice in Chains. Yeah. And then there were side stages. But yeah. And uh, Timothy Leary was also along on the tour. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> you know, one of the great things that started right at the beginning was on the very first show, Timothy Leary came up to us backstage and we had never met him or, you know, anything like that. And he just started, he said, I'm such a big fan. And apparently his son had been a big fan and had introduced him to Babes and Tron. And he loved our band. He started like playing air bass. I mean, it was just, the most, it was surreal. And then he asked if he could introduce the band and we said yes. And so he introduced our band for the whole tour every night. That is incredible. It was funny because midway through the tour, um, one night I went down to the hotel bar and he was by himself and, you know, and then I didn't know if he wanted to stay that way. So I didn't, and he's like, get over here. And so we had this big talk and it was just a wonderful night. And then at the, the very end of the tour, he said, I just want to thank you for being so authentic. And that was the, one of the best conversations I've had on the tour. And I was like, oh, my God, that was such a compliment. It felt so good. <laughs> well, you are authentic. That's why we love you, Mo. Jeez, jeez. Oh, my gosh. Well, well. on, on that note, uh, a couple of wrap-up questions, rapid fire. What was your first album that you purchased? The Long and Winding Road by The Beatles, it was a single. I stole all my albums from my sister, so I don't remember what I first bought. <laughs> okay. okay. Fair, fair, but I was listening to Bread and like Cheap Trick and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Well, since you're a, an artist, I can ask, what was the greatest show you ever performed? Greatest show? Probably the Reading Festival in England, because there's something about the power of a crowd. You know, I always described it as like the conduit of energy that like a loop between the audience and, and the performers and the sound. But that's like locked in with a huge crowd who knows all the words and stuff like that. It's, it's just it's quite amazing. You know, I don't know if that's how it was for everybody, but they seemed like they were having a lot of fun and we certainly were having a lot of fun. And we, we really had our things together by then and we were playing really well. And, you know, we had a good catalog by then. Awesome. Okay. What was the greatest show that you have ever seen? 
any Jesus Lizard show that has ever happened. Wow. I did not know you were such a fan. I mean, they're amazing. But... The best live band I ever saw. Ever. Always. Nobody's beat them. I tried. Amazing. Uh, you've had many, but there has to be one starstruck moment that really sticks out for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I asked the president of our label to introduce me to Neil Young. And he said, okay, just, okay, I'll do it. But just don't, you know, say anything about being a fan or, you know, just be cool. And I'm like, oh, of course, you know, I'll be cool. So I so he introduces me before he goes on stage and I go, oh my God, I'm such a big fan. I listen to Harvest all the time. <laughs> and Howie Klein just looks at me like, oh my God. And Neil just looks at him like, why did you do this to me? And he, it was just so, oh my God. <laughs> Did Neil say anything or? He just kind of was like, uh huh, you know, with something he's done a million times. But yeah, so. How funny, how funny. Well, it was fantastic to have you on the show. The stories were phenomenal. Is there a website? Is there somewhere people can learn more about your upcoming book or do we just need to stay tuned and, and wait? I, I keep a regular, you know, writing at on my Patreon page. It's uh, patreon.com slash Maureen Herman. So it's just my name. And uh, I write in there, you can subscribe for as little as $2 or for however much you want. And it's just, it's more intimate writing. It's some of it is book excerpts. And, you know, that's a good place to kind of, if you want to follow along and hear more stories, that's, that would be where I would go. All right. Well, thank you again for being on the show, Maureen Herman. We look forward to your new book and the stories as always were incredible. Thank you for the time, Jeff. It was fun. Thanks for listening to Voices Behind the Music, a growth network podcast production presented by Feed Media Group. We're on a mission to make it easy, fast, and legal for businesses to use music to power the most engaging customer experiences. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get yours and learn more about us at feedmediagroup.com.